Andrew Dobson, professor of ecology at Princeton University, has pointed out that biologists find themselves in a strange position at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 20th, 21st. Never before has a complete understanding of our subject seemed so within our reach. The ability of biologists to dissect and manipulate molecules on one end of the scale of biological organization, to monitor the structure and function of ecosystems on the other end of this scale, and to measure and analyzing living systems at all levels in between has never been greater. The pace of discovery is astounding, and we're now uncovering some of the most fundamental secrets of how life works. It's truly an exciting time to be a biologist, and I hope I've been able to convey some of the reasons for this excitement to you over the course of these lectures in the science of life. At the same time, however, Dobson has pointed out that our excitement as biologists is tempered by our realization that much of what we study, much of life on Earth, is in peril. Species, communities, entire ecosystems are being lost from the face of the planet at a frightening pace. At no other time in recorded human history have species gone extinct at such a high rate, or has the face of the planet itself undergone such a radical transformation. Just as we find ourselves on the brink of a truly deep understanding of the science of life, we also find ourselves on the brink of losing what makes our subject interesting, the biodiversity that makes biology what it is. That is, we're understanding life just as we're seeing it leave, potentially. Now, with this dilemma in mind, I'd like to begin this final lecture by first asking what we mean by biodiversity. What does it really mean to say we're losing biodiversity? Something we hear a lot about today. How do we measure this? Second, I'd like to ask why does biodiversity matter? Why should we care, if we should care at all, that species, communities, and ecosystems are being lost? Not surprisingly, this will bring us back to the subject of our last lecture, the extraordinary growth of the global human population. Humans, through the growth of their population and the application of their technologies, have had a major impact on the communities, communities of organisms with which we interact. And furthermore, we humans have begun to fundamentally transform the planet physically. This all sounds a bit grim, and I agree it is. But there is some cause for optimism, and we'll end this lecture by pointing out some of the reasons for this optimism. Well, one obvious measure of biological diversity, or what we now call biodiversity for short, is the number of different species of organisms that currently exist on the planet. That is, one way to assess the amount of variation we find in living systems is simply to count the number of distinct species there are. Actually, no one knows for sure how many species are presently on the face of the Earth. We don't even have a good estimate of that, and it's going to be a Herculean task to try to count them in any real way. Somewhere in the ballpark of about 1.7 million organisms have been described by biologists, but everybody agrees that this number must be a small fraction of the real total. Now, one problem is that many kinds of organisms that are likely to represent a very large number of species on the planet really have been very poorly studied. For example, only about 5,000 species of bacteria have been described. But when microbiologists used to, uh, began to use new techniques for sampling the number of species they found, specifically actually just scooping up samples of soil or cups of water from aquatic ecosystems and then sequencing the DNA that they find in there to estimate how many bacterial genomes have to be in there by comparing the, the DNA sequences to known sequences, they come up with estimates in just small samples of, of dozens or even hundreds of new species that must exist in there. Based on this kind of new genetic sampling technique, biologists now suspect that there are probably millions, not thousands, of different bacteria species, virtually all of them unknown to science. Another reason we have such an incomplete view of how many species really exist today is because biologists have done relatively little work describing species in the tropics, and this is where we expect biodiversity to be its highest. Now, it's not really that we've avoided the tropics, far from it. It's just that it's much harder to actually count things in the tropics because ecosystems are so complex there.
When we do look more closely at some new habitat in the tropics, we're often astounded at how many new species we find. For example, the Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson, we talked about E.O. Wilson in the context of biogeography a couple of lectures ago. Um, E.O. Wilson found in one tree in the Amazon basin 43 species of ants, 43 different species of ants in one tree. That's about the number of species of ants found in the entire British Isles. Okay? Now, it's not just that little things like ants or bacteria are what we've missed. An expedition in the, to the central Andes Mountains of Colombia that, that occurred in the mid-1990s actually described six new species of mammals. Um, these were mostly rodents, but this was six new species of mammals that were found in just a three-week-long expedition. Even new species of primates, which are probably the most carefully studied and described group of organisms in the world, even new species of primates are still being discovered, with nine new species being added in the 1990s to the 275 that were already known at that time. So all biologists really can do at present is to estimate the number of species on the planet, uh, extrapolating from the rate at which new species are being found. A very conservative estimate suggests that there are at least 10 million species, over five times the number that have been described so far. Other estimates, and these are not particularly wild estimates, suggest that the number of species on the planet may be 10 times this number, as many as 100 million, new, 100 million total species, meaning that we have really only described just a very small percentage of what's out there. Well, as I said, biodiversity on the species level is being lost at an alarming rate. Now, there are many, many facts and figures that I could give to support this contention. I'll just mention a few. For example, the so-called Red List, which is published by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, catalogs the plant and animal species on the planet that are known to be threatened. And by threatened, what they mean is that there's a greater than 10% chance that that species will go extinct in the next, in the next 100 years. Over 15% of all known mammals, over 10% of all known birds, 5% of the fish, and fully 10% of described plant species have been listed as threatened on the red list. And these are just the known species. If we look at the number of species that have actually been documented to have gone extinct in recent history, the picture is equally stark. Since 1600, this is before the onset of the Industrial Revolution, since 1600, 85 mammals out of a total of about 4,000 on the planet, or about 2.1% of the known mammals have gone extinct. 2.1% of all mammals have gone extinct since 1600. During the same period, 113 species of birds out of a total of about 9,000 or 9,500 or so, 113 species of birds have gone extinct, which is about 1.3% of the total. This is one to 2% of these groups of animals that have gone extinct in just the last 400 years. Even more recently, the number of species or, or the population sizes of certain species of some particular kinds of groups um, of organisms have really begun to plummet precipitously. For example, at least 32 species of amphibians out of a total of about 4,200 species that have been described, 32 species have gone extinct in just the past few years with another 26 species not having been observed for a number of years and thought to be likely to be extinct. That's about 1.4% of all the known amphibians having gone extinct in just a couple of decades or so. The litany goes on and on. We don't yet know how many species there are now on the planet, and we may actually never know because many of them may go extinct before we have a chance to even see them. Well, the number of species is only one way to measure biodiversity. An equally important measure of biodiversity is genetic variation. Now, genetic variation refers to the diversity of different alleles that are found in the gene pool of a population or a species. Genetic variation, genetic diversity, is really essential for the long-term survival of a species because it's genetic variation that enables adaptation to changing conditions. As we learned in the first third of the course, small population sizes often lead to the loss of genetic variation as alleles are lost through genetic bottlenecks and drift. 
as the number of individuals and populations of many species is reduced with the loss of habitat or the fragmentation of the habitat that's remaining, genetic diversity has dropped dangerously low. Now on the other end of the scale, from genes to ecosystems, another important measure of biodiversity is the diversity of ecosystems themselves. Different ecosystems, as you know, are characterized by different properties that include both the physical environment of that ecosystem and the species found within that ecosystem. And these different properties essentially regulate the way the ecosystem acquires and distributes energy and resources in living systems. The overall product productivity of the biosphere is affected by the variety of ecosystems with each different kind of ecosystem essentially contributing in a different way to the amount of energy and resource available to the biosphere as a whole. Through global biogeochemical cycles and interactions between these ecosystems and so forth. Some ecosystems on the planet are also being lost at an astounding rate. For example, the cumulative area of the tropical rainforests in the world is equal to about the size of the lower 48 United States. From this total, one estimate puts an area of approximately the size of West Virginia as being cut down or burned each year. So imagine that we took West Virginia on an annual basis and took it out of the area of the United States. It wouldn't be too many years, not very many decades before it's all gone. Now, some skeptics might argue that indeed it's unfortunate that biodiversity is being lost from the biosphere, but argue nonetheless as to whether this really matters all that much. I mean, why do we need all these species anyway? Certainly, some of us, and I'd include myself in this, may really care about biodiversity from simply an aesthetic or even a moral point of view. But others might not care that much about nature. Who's to fault them for that? Is there some reason to preserve biodiversity beyond its aesthetic value? Well, the answer here is a resounding yes. Perhaps the most important reason for preserving biodiversity from a selfish point of view is to preserve it as a repository of the chemicals and genes found there that can ultimately benefit humanity. Over 25% of the prescription drugs used in the U.S. now contain compounds that were originally derived as natural products from plants. And new medicines are constantly being isolated from natural sources. Over 40% of all of the non-prescription and prescription drugs used in the world, in fact, are based on natural products. For example, the world's most widely used drug, aspirin, was originally derived from the leaves of a tropical willow tree. Similarly, and more recently, one of the most effective treatments for the form of cancer known as Hodgkin's disease, and also for some types of leukemia, a childhood leukemias, is a drug that was derived from a tropical plant called the rosy periwinkle found in the uh, rainforests of Madagascar. The drug Taxol, which is now a very common and potent anti-cancer agent, was extracted first from the Pacific yew tree, which is essentially a scrapwood species found in the old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Both the Madagascar rainforest and the old growth Pacific Northwest forest are now really in serious danger of being lost because of logging. Wouldn't it have been unfortunate if these two species the rosy periwinkle and the Pacific U had gone extinct before somebody had stumbled across the drugs that they provided us with. Now, diverse organisms provide us with a number of other economically important benefits in addition to being just a source of new drugs. For example, the current revolution in genetic engineering that we've talked about has depended on the ability to rapidly replicate DNA in the laboratory. Essentially, you often need for many of these techniques to have a lot of copies of the gene that you're interested in. Well, you can get a lot of copies by trying to extract it from the organisms repeatedly, but it's easier to just take one copy and what, do what we would call amplify it in the lab. This, is, this involves a process known as the polymerase chain reaction. Now, interestingly, the polymerase chain reaction depends on a particular form of the enzyme DNA polymerase that was isolated from a bacteria found around hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. The reason this is so useful is that this bacteria had evolved to basically replicate DNA in a really hot environment. And so this, this particular form of DNA polymerase can be used under laboratory conditions at high temperatures in a way that allow this DNA polymerase reaction to occur very quickly.
Who could have guessed that this odd species of bacteria adapted to live in the hot springs of some national park could possibly be responsible for revolutionizing advances in modern genetics? Well, further no, furthermore, with the advent of genetic engineering techniques, we now can take whatever useful genes we find in other species and transfer them to other species. We can, we can take a useful uh, gene and put it into a crop species or, or perhaps put it into a bacteria to allow that bacteria to be essentially a, a little biological factory. All of this makes it all the more important that we have access to the materials that we can use to do these marvelous things. Well. My point here is simply that if we're unmoved by biodiversity for aesthetic or other personal reasons, we still have a vested interest in preserving what is essentially an untapped warehouse of natural products and genes that may eventually benefit us in ways we can hardly imagine. As species go extinct, they take their genomes with them. And basically, once that genome is gone, we'll never have a chance to ask whether it might have included something we could have found useful. Preserving entire ecosystems also is something we humans should do entirely out of a sense of self-interest. Ecosystems, through their biogeochemical interactions with other ecosystems and with the biosphere as a whole, play essential roles in maintaining aspects of our own environment. For example, ecosystems provide natural filtration mechanisms that purify water. They provide breeding grounds for economically important uh, food sources, such as commercial fisheries. Uh, very large ecosystems, actually, like, for example, tropical rainforests in the world, even influence climate and weather patterns. These kinds of functions are called ecosystem services in natural environments. And the loss of an ecosystem and the loss of the ecosystem services it provides often requires very expensive alternatives to replace those services to the extent that they impact our own lives. Well, given the growth of the human population, what we looked at last time, and especially the extraordinary growth that humans, uh, the human population has experienced over the last couple of hundred years, it's no surprise that human activities has con have contributed overwhelmingly to the loss of biodiversity we're now experiencing. Several consequences of human population growth have had particularly serious impacts on biodiversity. Primary among these is, as I've already mentioned, habitat destruction. Also, over-harvesting of species has led to the loss of those species. And, most interestingly, the introduction of invasive species, as we either directly or inadvertently move a species from one place on to, uh, to another on the planet, has basically lost, uh, resulted in the loss of enormous amount of biodiversity to where those species end up being. Now, in addition to the direct ecological impacts of our activities, the burgeoning human population also has begun to transform the biosphere overall through our disturbance of biogeochemical cycles. As I told you last time, the development of new technologies have essentially short-circuited natural biogeochemical cycles, allowing us to take certain chemicals out of normal inorganic repositories and bring them into living systems for our own use, largely to increase productivity of the ecosystems that we depend on. Now, what have, been the, what have been the consequences of these human-induced perturbations to biogeochemical cycles? Let's just consider one example that may be of particular importance, which is the addition of excess carbon dioxide, excess carbon, to the atmospheric uh, component of the carbon biogeochemical cycle. There's now no question remaining but that the level of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is steadily rising and has been since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. There are a variety of ways to estimate the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide in the past, but if you look at different averages, these measurements suggest that the level of atmospheric CO2 was somewhere in the range of about 260 to 280 parts per million before industrialization began, say sometime in the early 1600s. In 1958, a monitoring station was built in Hawaii that began to measure atmospheric carbon dioxide directly. The first measurements taken at that time recorded a concentration of 315 parts per million. Within three decades, this figure had risen further to over 350 uh, parts per million, and it now stands somewhere at about 370 parts per million.
Actually, changes in atmospheric carbon are very dynamic. If you look at the pattern of carbon uh, in the atmosphere, you see that it actually fluctuates quite a bit on an annual basis. It, it increases during summer in the northern hemisphere because of all the increased productivity of the forests that exist in the norm northern hemisphere, and it decreases in the winter. But in spite of these periodic oscillations, there's a clear upward trend. Well, what are the consequences of this increase in atmospheric CO2? Why does it matter to us? Well, the answer to this has to do with the fact that carbon dioxide is one of several gases produced by industrial processes that are known as greenhouse gases. These gases are called greenhouse gases because they're thought to be responsible for global warming through the greenhouse effect. Well, how does the greenhouse effect work? It actually, the, the answer is pretty simple. CO2 and other greenhouse gases are transparent to visible light. So the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere actually has relatively little or no effect on the amount of incoming solar energy that the Earth receives from the sun. However, CO2 absorbs and reflects infrared radiation, that is heat. And remember that energy that comes into the planet from the sun ultimately leaves the planet in the form of heat. CO2 absorbs this heat keeps it in the planet, essentially forming a blanket, a greenhouse around the planet, which is thought to increase global temperatures. Well, the best evidence now suggests that mean global temperatures are rising. There's considerable debate about how much change there's been in average annual temperatures across the planet, partly because temperature trends vary dramatically both up and down over a matter of years or even decades. But in spite of these fluctuations, climatologists now suggest that the mean global temperature has risen, risen on the order of 0.6 degrees Celsius since the turn of the uh, 20th century. In other words, over about the last 100 years. Evidence for this global warming trend can be seen in several ways. For example, measurements of the thickness of the ice at the North Pole have decreased by about 40 percent. 40 percent decrease in the thickness of the ice over about the same period. Now, the key question here, I have to admit, is whether the observed increase in CO2 levels in the atmosphere and the observed increase in global temperatures are causally related. I mean, it may not be that they are, and this question was the subject of considerable debate in the 1990s. But most scientists now have concluded that there is a functional link. An increase in atmospheric CO2 has been established, an increase in global temperatures has been established, and most would now agree that the former is at least in part responsible for the latter. Well, Current projections suggest that in the next 100 years, atmospheric CO2 levels will continue to rise to somewhere to about, somewhere about 500 to maybe 1,200 parts per million. That's quite an increase. If this happens, how will this affect temperatures? You can imagine that, again, the answer to this question um, varies quite a bit depending on the assumptions. But a recent study by, done by a United Nations sponsored panel of international climate experts suggested that if the current trend is maintained in the rise in CO2, global temperatures will rise as well by an additional 1.4 to as much as 5.8 degrees Celsius in the next 100 years. So what would be the consequence of that change? Well, I want to point out that if we go with the low estimate, an increase of only 1.4 degrees Celsius, that would make the Earth warmer on average than it's been in the last 100,000 years. Clearly, it's only speculation at this point to suggest what specific changes might occur, but one obvious thing that would occur if global temperatures rise like that is a shift in species distributions. Species would basically be moving more northerly as temperatures rose and they were looking for their preferred temperature, their preferred climate. Interestingly, these kinds of shifts have already been documented going on right now in a variety of kinds of species of plants or things like butterflies or even birds. There's been a measurable increase or I should say shifting to more northerly latitudes. Well. Let's not worry about the animals and plants. Let's say, what about us? How would those affect us? What would rising global temperatures really do to us? Well, it's hard to know. There's some good news maybe and some bad news. One, one interesting thing is that sea levels might rise. Now, how much sea levels would rise, again, is debated, but one estimate says, well, if the polar ice caps keep melting at the rate that they are, then um, maybe there would be a rise of only one meter in sea level. But three feet is quite a bit for a coastal city. 
And you can imagine that that amount of a change in sea level would be something that could be actually quite catastrophic for some human populations. Well, a probably a, far more, a, a more far-reaching effect of rising global temperatures will be on the way agriculture works. And here there could be both positive and negative effects. Higher temperatures are correlated with higher productivity in ecosystems. So maybe it would be a good thing if temperatures go up. In fact, the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere also might increase productivity of, um, of crop plants. Actually, the data on how CO2 levels affect productivity in plants is mixed depending on the ecosystems. In some cases, it seems as though it does increase productivity. In some cases, it seems as though it doesn't. Now, not all crops may benefit from this. Some crops may be actually adversely affected by changes in temperature or actually changes in weather patterns that would accompany these changes in temperature. It's really too soon to say whether there would be a net positive or negative effect of warming on our own agriculture. Well, when I think of the gro growth of human populations and its effect on biodiversity, and biogeochemical cycles in the biosphere, I have to admit that I get pretty nervous sometimes. The impact of our species on the biosphere has been referred to by some as the equivalent of a human asteroid. Now, the image being alluded to here, alluded to here is that of the asteroid that appears to have struck the Earth about 65 million years ago, resulting in a global ecological disaster that quickly led to the demise of uh, more than half of all the species living on the planet at that time, including the dinosaurs. Well, that sounds pretty bad. But I don't want to leave you with the idea that all the news is bad. The world has changed because of human impact, and it's likely to continue to change. But there is reason to believe that we can avert this kind of ecological disaster, that we don't have to be a human meteor, and that we might be able to sustain a, a stable ecological relationship with the rest of the planet. The first piece of good news is that although the human population continues to rise, growth rates appear to have begun to level off in a very serious way. In fact, they began to level off at the end of the 20th century. Some of this reduction is due to lower fertility rates among women, correlating in general with better education and better economic opportunities. The most recent 50-year projection made by the United Nations Population Division, they do this periodically, suggests that one possible scenario, depending on how you assume growth rates will go, one possible scenario is that the size of the human population in the year 2050 will only reach about 7.3 billion and in fact might start decreasing. And that's pretty good. We're at 6.3 billion now. Maybe we can fit just another billion in. Now, more dire predictions by this same estimate with higher growth rates that might occur actually come up with higher values. For example, the high-end prediction currently on the table by this group is 10.7 billion people by the year 2050. We can only hope that the more optimi uh, optimistic estimate is also the more accurate one. Well, here's a second piece of good news. Biologists, of course, governments, and people in general are becoming aware of the biodiversity crisis and they're taking concrete steps to do something about it. Biodiversity preserves are being designed and planned on a global scale. And in fact, steps are being taken to uh, minimize as much as possible further uh, negative impact on critical, bio, uh, uh, critical ecosystems uh, to preserve species um, and communities found there. There's a lot of work to be done there, but we have much of the knowledge we have many of the tools, and increasingly, we have some of the political willpower to do this. Now, E.O. Wilson, in a recent book called The Future of Life, paints a pretty bleak picture of what's happening today, but he actually remains very optimistic that it's not too late to turn the tide. Among his many works, Wilson has argued that humans have something that he calls biophilia, which is really what he would argue is a genetically based, an innate affinity for the natural systems in which we live. And so Wilson is arguing, essentially, that biophilia will drive us as a species to do the right thing, as long as we know what we need to do. Well, there's one more piece of good news, and that is that the biosphere itself might help us out a little bit. For example, one of the difficulties in predicting future trends in global atmospheric carbon levels is the possibility, in fact, the likelihood that the biosphere eventually will absorb some of this excess through increased photosynthesis and productivity or by atmospheric carbon being absorbed by the ocean's vast carbon buffer.
Clearly, it's in our interest to reduce the rate at which we continue to put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but it's possible that the biosphere's own biological and physical response to this imbalance will somehow bring it uh, more closely into equilibrium. Well, I began this course with a quote from the beginning of the book, The Science of Life, that was published by, the, by H. G. Wells in 1929, in which Wells emphasized the importance of understanding biology for the conduct, conduct of our daily lives. Let me conclude with another quote from that same book, one near the end of the book. Wells writes, on the whole, we believe that our species will survive and triumph over its present perplexities. There's much in life that makes intelligent men impatient, but it's not reasonable to let impatience degenerate into pessimism. Now, Wells goes on and describes some of the problems of, that he thought knowledge of biology would help back in his day. And then he goes on to conclude, mankind will only survive on the condition that he must take control not only of his own destiny, but also of the whole of life. By understanding biology, we can take better control of our own destiny, and even if we don't control life, we can better learn how to participate with life as a member of the ecosystem in which we live. Like Wells, I'm, opt I'm optimistic that we will be able to do this.